See, I'm trying to work out, is she a sociopath or a psychopath or what's the deal with Basically her? Basically a raving lunatic. Is or is she a say. raving lunatic or is she just a normal person who has a fucking crack? On this week's podcast, I've got the one and only Roxy Jacenko. And Roxy and I, we're mates from a long time ago, and I'm going to talk about all the new stuff she's doing. I'm not going to talk about all the old shit. We all know about the old stories about Roxy. We're going to leave that in the past. We're talking about all the new stuff she's doing. Roxy, what's the thing that's pressing your buttons right now? What did you? What are you really enjoying doing? Look, I've lo- I, I think everything's an opportunity, and you know what? I take everything that comes my way. You Obviously, never say no, do you? No, it's not an option. Yeah, you say yes to everything. Yes to everything, and I think you know that's been the success of my business. But what, and what are you doing right now? Like, what's well, we're talking about I am Roxy, I mean, that's... Uh, the, <laughs> this, this is, is Roxy. Chat. She's actually got a show called Talking About Herself, I Am Roxy, I Am Myself. <laughs> well, how's that going? It's going really well. And actually, this is my first chat since it aired right? last Wednesday. Yep, the exclusive. This is an exclusive. So, uh, we, we talk about... And I actually, one of the things I want to know about is what drives Roxy. I'm trying to work out, is she a sociopath or a psychopath or what's the deal with Basically her? a raving lunatic. Is or is she a raving lunatic or is she just a normal person who has a fucking crack? If you want to hear more about this, come listen to me, Mark Boris at The Mentor on podcast1australia.com.au. This is a cracker. (laughs) Thank you. Roxy Jacenko, welcome to The Mentor. Thank you. I'm very excited. Oh, so am I. Look, uh, I haven't seen you for quite a while, maybe a year or two, Um, but I should declare early, I'm a Roxy fan. (laughs) <laughs> Roxy was on the Celebrity Apprentice many years ago. She she brained him. What, what was the other PR lady's name that you? Prue McSweet. Prue, How could oh I ever God. forget? Uh, I had two <laughs> PR ladies at the time. Let's loosely describe Roxy as a PR person at the time, publicity person. Um, but I had Prue, who was old school publicity, and I thought this is going to be so good. The two of them going to be at each other, and fucking oath, they were at each other oh, the were, whole time. Were we ever? I was glad great. we left with any hair. It was great. <laughs> it was real good television. Just for that, it was worth watching. So, Roxy, a lot's happening at the moment um, for you, and I'm here to talk to you. I don't really want to talk about Sweaty Betty. I mean, you've been good to us. You, you've been giving us plenty of guests come on the show, and I've been appreciating that. That's been fantastic. Um, but I don't want to talk about Sweaty Betty. I want to talk about all the new stuff you're doing at the yes. moment. So you've sort of reinvented yourself. And what amazes me is how people like you, controversy follows you all the time. Most people would never be able to get up after the sum of the, the hooks that you've copped on the chin in a media sense and, you know, generally. But somehow you just, you're just like bulletproof. You just get up and you keep going, how the hell does that all work? I think that your detractors become your biggest motivators. You know, everyone has got something to say. And generally, it's been negative. But as I said, when I did I Am Roxy, you know, you didn't think I could do it to all of the people out there who have been the naysayers. And look, I've done it. So what it's done is, yeah, don't worry, it gets me down. But at the same time, I go, well, you know what? Fuck you. Yeah, Watch me. I'm totally. going to work even harder. I'm going to get up from the lower lows and I'm going to succeed. Well, yeah. Roxy's like, you know, she's less than 40. More than 35 in age, <laughs> <You're> okay? You're kind. <laughs> and um, she looks like she just jumped off the catwalk, by the way. She's walked in here with like a fake fur. Is it fake or real? Of course it is. I don't yeah. want red paint thrown okay. on me. Thank you very she's much. She's got a fake fur, but she just looks, she just looks like she just jumped off the catwalk. Anyone would think that um, she had, hasn't had a moment stress in her whole life. So let's just cast you back to when you're Roxy Jacenko, 15 years of age, no mobile phone, Where'd you go to school? What's the deal? Like, tell me about your parents because I want to know how this person formed. Yeah, well, it all came from my upbringing. You know, totally. don't get me wrong. There's been a lot of people who have said, oh, her parents have given her everything. And I won't lie. My parents are wealthy and they've done very well. But what they've they've done is they've worked very hard. You know, my dad was from um, North Ryde. He just went to the local public school. My mum was from the East End of London. They invested in property. They did very, very well. But what they taught me is if you want, you work. And that has stuck with me. Since the age of 14, I had a job. I was at McDonald's as a drive through girl. Did they give me things? Yeah, they did. They gave me education and they gave me work ethic. Were they the parents who delivered me a BMW with a red bow on it? Absolutely not. Uh, it was a Volvo that was 18 years old. So they instilled in me, if I want, then I have to work. And that's what has given me what I've got today. That's why I can get up in the morning and go, well, you know what? doesn't matter how bad it is out there for me in terms of negative publicity. I've got two children and I've got a husband who I, I'm the breadwinner. It's a single income family and I've got to work hard. And that came from my childhood. So necessity. But sometimes there's a lot of people there who, who, you know, the necessity is in this. There's nothing on their plate. They have to work hard. But a lot of people just 
can't get themselves out of bed to do it or they just can't come up with a, w- a way of doing it or always whinge and complain. And why does someone like Roxy just say, I've got to do this, I'm going to do this, and this is what I'm going to do? Like, in other words, you invent good something, enough you do Because good enough in my mind is not good enough. Well, where good does enough that, where will does never that come do. from? Were you like that at school? I was, well, I wish I was like that at school. Maybe I'd be a lawyer now, Mark. <laughs> it well, would be much well, easier. if you're a lawyer now, you'd be earning a lot less than you're earning now. So, <laughs> and it'd be a tougher life too. So True. Um, no, you know what? Uh, it is an upbringing thing. And yes, you know what? I also don't want to want, and that sounds like a really weird thing to say, but if I see something and I want to have it, I want to be able to go out there and get it. And yeah, that's materialistic, but I want to work hard enough to know that I can never want and also to provide my children with an upbringing like I had. And that doesn't mean flashy things. That means a good education, extra help with school tutoring or whatever it may be. That's what makes me do it. I don't know anything else. I've only ever worked my whole life. I never got into uni. I dropped out of TAFE after two of a three-year course and I went to work for Mark Curie and Theo Honest Faroo as a receptionist. So I've really come... So you worked for Max, did you? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, he was... At, at, uh, at Mark's shirts? I worked for Mark's and then I worked for Diesel, which was his... Remember, he yeah, was yeah, the yeah, importer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I Diesel. remember he, he got the Australian rights for it. Yeah. Great mate of mine, Mark. We were all great friends. It was a terrible tragedy that he Shocking. died so young. So but... I was with him throughout that whole journey. So it was quite interesting when I got cancer. I, you know, for me, I had been through the journey with him. He obviously was diagnosed with cancer. He tried all sorts of other remedies. Totally. Um, holistic remedies yep. to try and get through it. He, pro- he prolonged his life for as long as he could. So when I got cancer, I was right onto all of the green juices and the herbs and... But, you know, it's sad. Everyone gets it now, it seems. Yeah, yeah, it was. So you, I didn't realise that you start off in uh, Mark's... was his receptionist. Mark's, really? Yeah. yeah. And then he kept promoting me. So I was I started his recep- as his receptionist and then he said, do you want to be the PR and marketing manager? And I was like, yes, absolutely. He said, fantastic, I'll get you a business card. So then I was like a kid in a candy shop handing my business card to everyone in Sundry. I had no idea what I was doing, but what he did was he gave me the foundation to be able to go, right, this is what I'm doing. I have to find a way to do it because I've got no education in it. I had no background in communications. Um, He taught me it was like a sales role. He taught me that be the quickest to deliver what the media want and the rest is Was it PR history. like in, in terms of corporate PR or was it more publicity? No, it was publicity. Yeah, so you're diesel like a and publicist. Marks. For, yeah. yeah, correct. With no experience sitting on the reception desk. So well, how the hell did you take that on? You, you, I mean, you are the sort of person... You I say know, yes to everything. 100%, yeah, and uh, work it out later. That's, uh, that's my motto. Yeah, yeah. You know, like have an open door policy, say yes, yes, yes. It's like my books. I've got five books now. I've never read a freaking book. <laughs> but why did I say yes? Because I want to be the only girl who's done the books. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when I often say to people, just have a crack and backfill later. That's exactly say right. Yes. Worry about it later. Fill it because if you overthink it, you'll fuck it up. Or, or you you'll miss the it. opportunity you completely. Someone else will pick it up. Yeah, so, so, so I just want to go back. So you were, Mark put you in charge of publicity yeah. at um, Mark's and Diesel. Yeah. And Diesel, by the way, for those people who younger people who don't know, was, was, a, ma- was a massive... The king of jeans. To bring into Australia. They were like 300 bucks a pair of jeans when everyone else, would, you know, pay, Levi's had cost you 60 bucks or something. <laughs> but for some reason, we all wanted to buy $300 jeans because this were new queuing. brand. Of, Italian yeah. brand, yeah. Renzo Russo. Correct. And uh, and I remember Theo on his room and Mark got it together somehow. Yeah. I, don't know, I can't remember how that worked. It was how. definitely Mark's doing. I think Theo was the brains and the negotiator and Mark was the creative. <laughs> Theo has always managed to be, be in sort of the deals everywhere. Yeah. I don't know how he ever did that. Yeah. But, but, but you, as publicist for, those two brands, how the hell do you know what to do? Like, would you- I didn't. You know what? I hit the ground and I knew if I was hungry, if I, I used Google a lot, I must say, if I was hungry, if I presented it in a way that people were interested. I also knew I had an angle because exactly what you said, Levi's was $60, diesel jeans were between $300 and $700. So I knew already I had a hook because people wanted to know, well, hang on a second, why does everyone want these jeans? $300 to $700 when you can buy $60 jeans? And that was our angle. These were these amazing Italian jeans and we'd never seen anything like that in Australia. So I just hit the ground and I run. I don't but know. But how do you find a journalist to write about Because, I mean, it's all about getting media attention. So did you use Mark and or, or not Theo, but did you use Mark's profile or did you no. use the, the product's profile? The product's profile. The product's profile. So you took the product's profile and what did you do? Do you spray all the journalists, like, you know, to keep hitting them with um, press releases in those days? Well, it was press releases in those days, but of course I couldn't write a press release because I was not schooled in how to even formulate a press release. So I created news snippets because I couldn't write a press release. So I just wrote little news snippets to the journalists. But I think 15, 20 years ago, 
you picked up the freaking phone. Yeah. Now everyone wants to rely on an email and hope for the best. Or, d- or a direct message on Correct. Instagram. Correct. Sorry, but pick up the phone. So that old school thing you think still works? I mean, because I think it's it is too. Because you know vital. what? If you're a journalist, if you're a person trying to promote a brand and you're sending stuff by electronically to a journalist who you're hoping the journalist will pick that up, one thing that I know is that the journalists are getting hit by a, a thousand things in a day. You're one of many. And they don't read it. They're not interested. So do you still, would you still advise those individuals who are either trying to run publicity businesses or work for people doing publicity or just have a brand and want to get it promoted, it's better just to try and pick the phone up and talk to somebody? Yes, because no one uses the phone anymore. So you can rest assured if you ring that journalist, I'll pick up the phone. Well, one thing is for sure, if Roxy Jusenko rings up, they're probably going to answer the phone. But, but I mean, if... Like, I still think no matter who. Right. You know, it's very hard to say no to someone when you've got them on the telephone. It's much easier to say, yes, okay, I'll consider it. If it's an email, the quickest thing to do is delete. Well, I didn't read it. Just just don't read it. And you don't you even always... open it or if you do open it, you delete it. So there's a, there is a flaw then in the, the current way people try to promote businesses and or brands and it, because it is And in business in largely, general. Uh, agencies do everything electronically. It's, generally speaking, it's all electronic, electronic, and they just try and they, they apply the spray technique and it's hope lazy. they hit something. It's lazy. You have the advantage, your business has the advantage that it's got your name attached to it and then what people will be worried about is if they don't answer the phone, that there might be some sort of ramification. Uh, you're not wrong. I would say that over the 15 years of having my businesses, that is definitely a positive. They will pick up the phone more often than not. But at the same time, I think people are also respectful of someone who actually has the balls to yeah. pick up the phone and call and say, hi, we don't know each other, but I've got this product. I'd love to get you in to try it. And how do you find these people who write this stuff? I mean, how do you know? How does Roxy know or how does somebody else know? Who to pick the phone up to? Do you have to read all the newspapers? What is it? Yeah, you should it? be. You yeah. know, I still get the newspapers every day. I still get the magazines, go to the news agency and buy the magazines. We've got something in our office called the Bible. And in that Bible is A to Z dividers in a um, lever arch file and the mastheads from every magazine and every newspaper. So go to the news agent, pull out the section that says editor, deputy editor, creative director. You can create your database of media contacts very easily. Now, if you look at a newspaper, the name of the journalist who wrote the story is on there. And yep. if for some reason it's not, Google it. And then what do you do? Just just take someone through. So you, you let's say um, um, you pick up an article and it's they're writing about uh, Jim's for argument's sake and um, it's, you know, Mary Lou is writing for the Sunday Telegraph yes. about gyms and lifestyle, et cetera. Um, Roxy now knows she's got a client who's got a gym that's going to be open up soon. What do you do? What, what do you think to yourself, oh, maybe that person right imagines, maybe they want some more material. Should I ring them up? What do you, you do? You ring them and you get them in. People want experience. So it's right. all well and good to say, okay, I've got this new gym and this is what we offer and these are the times of the classes and this is the cost, but that's boring. Your edge is getting them into experience. And I think now there's been a big change. PR is not PR. It's creative communications. You need to give an experience. So it's all well and good to pitch the gym. But get her in. Give her a one-on-one class. Invite her and her girlfriend in to try it. They need to like it, try it, buy it. They're not necessarily buying it, but you want them to buy into the story and the offering. They'll sell it for it. To sell it to the reader. So where did did you get this instinct from? Was it just your experience? Did you always know this or did you think you evolved into this uh, through making mistakes? I think I'm a sales girl through and through. Um, I had to use a sales technique to put me in front of the people who studied communications and journalism and PR at uni because I didn't have that. Um, But I also think you learn as you go. You make the mistake, you pick yourself up and you keep going. I mean, there's been several times when, you know, I've done something wrong and I've gone, oh, fuck. Mm. But you know what? I use that as my example to my team to say, okay, well, that didn't work. Use me as your sounding board. This is how we've got to do it this time. So how many people got? A, how many people do you have now? Sweaty Betty, I said I wasn't going to talk well, about that, but how many people? No, got? there's you know there's like five businesses now, so well, there's about twenty five of us. Yeah, but just Sweaty Betty, just the PR um, publicist oh, business. PR, um, I'd say probably twelve. Twelve people. Yeah. Yeah, and and do they have to go and find their own clients, or does everything no, come through you? Everything's through me. Right. So I answer every email. I know every waking moment of my business, and I think the second you take your finger off the pulse and think, "Well, I'm the boss." I'll leave it to someone else's when you don't have a business. Oh, I can tell you that's, uh, that, that sort of happened to Yellow Brick Road, to be honest with you. Now I've taken the reins back at the beginning of this year and I've completely reorganised and reshaped the business. And it, to be honest with you, it's like been fantastic. I've really enjoyed Like I've just come back from our Darwin um, annual conference in Darwin. 
We had like 400 people. And they want there. you. They love it. They and they, want they join you. because, I mean, I forget, I forget about that sort of stuff. They want you. They, they feel empowered. They you started it from them. nothing. I want to be with mm. them. I get my tyres pumped up hanging yes. around and talking yes. to them. And they, yes. you know, it's just. Encouraged. I feel so good after being there. And, um, you know, and, and I would have missed out if I hadn't have gone. And generally speaking, I'm not very social. So I go, oh, I'm not going. Nor am I. It's too hard. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. My allergy is people You're, when they ask me in a restaurant. I'm like, people? I'm not. I'm the most non-social person you meet. You'll meet. And the funny thing is, it was like this. I'm doing a brand boot camp, an online course, um, and one of the modules in that course is faking it until you make it. I am not the most confident person. I actually find this particularly difficult. But you have to get into character. You have to fake it until you make it. So let's Whether talk you're about confident that. or not confident. Well, that's, okay, that's that's really interesting because a lot of people just say, "Oh no, that's that's Roxy just saying go. That's easy for her because she's naturally extroverted and outgoing." Okay, that's what people would say. Ah, uh, I know. So. Tell me who Roxy really is and then tell me how you become that person that people see. I step into character. The second I step into character, I become misconfident. Do I enjoy it? No, I don't. Do I do it because it brings me business? Yes, I do. So you compartmentalise who you've got to be for the moment. Yep. So... I turn it on. Which one's the real you? The Roxy's reserved and doesn't like to go out. I don't socialise. I've got four friends and if I'm not at work, I'm with my children. So... Okay, so Roxy really on Saturday night, unless she's got to go, unless she's got something there's there's, there's money in it, or there's a yes. client in it, or there's I'm at home. A, you would stay home. I'm on Instagram stalking for ideas. Yeah, and watch. Do you watch telly? Okay, you need to tune into Power. Have you seen Power on Stan? No. <gasps> it's the best show ever. I'm hooked. Other than I, yeah, Roxy, is it like of course. Billions and all those other. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't. You fake it until you make it. So you th- then you can turn it on though. I can turn it on and I've learned to turn it on. Okay. Well, Turning it on brings like me business. How, how the hell did you work that shit out? I mean, I do it, but I want to know how you did it. How, how, I mean, I do it. I perform. So, but how do you It is a performance, performance, isn't it? And that's why when you do your seminars, I said, you know, how you do three states back to back, I don't know. Because turning on that character and being that extrovert is absolutely exhausting. It totally. It is for me. Um, how do you do it? You learn it. Um, the reality is if you're confident about what you're talking about, I think it becomes easier to step into character. If you've been doing it for a number of years, you, there's a confidence that's built. I also think that if you're in a space that is familiar to you, it's always a better way of so doing you know your it. content? Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, for instance, for me, I'm out of my normal space with you here. You're yep. going to feel a lot more confident than I am because yep. you're used to this surrounding. For me, if it's a new business meeting, come into my office. I'll get you a hire car to pick you up and bring you to me because in my own space, in my own surroundings, I can perform, I can deliver because it's familiar. Right. So but did, does Roxy ever get really nervous and sort of feel like she's going to be a bit sick before she does a performance? Yeah, yeah. there's pills for that. Yeah. No, but do you, would you take uh, beta, blo- beta blockers? Do you, do, oh, would, I don't know what that is, but I take well, pills adre- now. Things are, drop your adrenaline down. Oh, so I used to do perform. that with Nurofen Plus, but then they made it prescription only. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you can't get. I mean, I know a lot of blokes or well, people who perform who, who use beta blockers to keep the adrenaline down. I need to get onto that. I'll be taking a mental note of it. But no, th- I take. I used to take Neurofen Plus until I got a stomach ulcer and it exploded, and I ended up in the back of an ambulance. No, now I take Effexor, which is like a anxiety drug. Yeah, well, that's that's a beta blocker. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, well, that's what I have. Yeah, so I mean, I, I know a lot of people do it because um, the adrenaline can get so out of control that it's a terrible feeling. That you can't it's like think. it's like there's a, an elephant standing on your chest. So yes, you fake it until you make it, and you know that confidence it comes with knowing your craft, but also being in an area or surroundings that you know. So I, I, we got to go to the break, but I want to be you just talk about fake it till you make it, and that is that that's a, a, a module of your Roxy's brand boot camp. Yeah. Before I go to the break, let's just quickly talk about that. That's a new business or just. So I've always done seminars for the last five years and done really well, all states, sort of 700 people at a time. But what I realise is people want more. They want, you know, four weeks, continual classes, which really delve much deeper than a two-hour seminar can. So that starts this month. Um, What is it? Tell me what what a a brand boot camp is. So basically whether you're a personal brand or you're a business brand and you want to grow your brand, you want to understand the important elements to building a brand, we talk about the foundation. So the first thing you need to do, people don't go out looking to build a brand. You can't go out looking to build a brand. You have to build your foundations first Mm. to even have a chance to build a brand. Um, we talk about confidence and networking. We talk about social media and how to use it and get the most out of it. Um, look, I think it a- delves... Over how many days? Four weeks. Four, four weeks. weeks. Yep. They're all video courses. So, look, I think it'll be oh, it's interesting. Online. It's online. It's online. Yeah. And that's also because there's so many people in regional Australia who have said, look, we can't get to Sydney. We can't get to, you know, um, Melbourne City, etc. Particularly et regional Australia. Yeah. And I don't think that the people in regional Australia should miss out. So, I decided to make it online, which has been fun. It's been a huge uh, job. Have you launched it yet? It's, it's actually happening? It's 
it's so the enrolments are open now and then the actual course starts on the 30th of September. So look, it'll be it, it's been really rewarding. You know, to fa- the fact that I was the, the the shit student, I was a receptionist for Marks and Diesel and now I can say, you know what? I've learned enough over my 15 years to show you how I've built five brands from nothing, from scratch and made them into brands that are Well, household. not only that, you look after other people's brands too. Yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah. your, your original business, yes. Sweaty Betty. That's yeah. your original business. And uh, I mean, I guess you do know how to do brands. And what you're now doing is you get your, you're going to parlay that knowledge on a, on a digital environment to, uh, to allow people in regional Australia. I'm trying so, to come into 2019, Mark. I just do, I still use a how, cash check every Friday. I don't even have an ATM card. How many hours card. a week? How long did it take you to get this package together? Ages. You know, we worked on this for probably two months. I've actually done it in partnership with Mia Friedman, who has been a great supporter of mine for many years. And she's got a a lot of knowledge uh, when it comes to online, which I don't have in terms of getting podcasts up and websites and and courses. Yeah, we filmed it it all. Is it audio or filmed? It's filmed. It's filmed, right. So you had to film the whole thing and then it had to be edited and then you had to build the content. Yeah, it's been a huge job. So then there's the worksheets as well. But look, I think, I think it'll be rewarding for a lot of people and, and I know that I can talk about the mistakes I've made but then also the positives. It's actually good because you own the, you own the broadcast, um, you can control the content. Yes. Um, it's sort of like PR for Roxy in that in that you can control people's perception of yeah. you. Yeah. You can show them another side of Roxy. Or and I think the, that's what the TV show did. Yeah, well, yes, well, I was well, like, I'm going to talk about the TV show when we come back. Right. From, I'm, I'm going to talk about the TV show. He's telling me I need to shut up now. Yeah, no, no, but I'm going to go to the break. <laughs> I want to know it because I don't want to just – Talk about the TV show fleetingly. I actually want to have a good crack at that. Yeah. So, but like, but what's interesting about this is, I mean, I, I see James Packer wrote a book. Mm. We've got someone to do an autobiography about him. And a lot of people do this shit. They actually go out and they control the perception about themselves. John Ibram has done the same yes. thing about his book. Yeah. They control the perception about themselves by writing the story in case someone else is going to write it. Mm. Well, you're doing, not, you're oh, not well, writing Oh, well, I've had the other person write it as well, which was such a load of shit. <laughs> yeah, but you're, <laughs> but you're now you're doing a, a, a whole podcast, which is basically a broadcast over a month, over a four-week period, and this is Roxy Jacenko introducing yeah. herself to regional Australia. Yeah. They'll make the decision what they think about Roxy Jacenko, yes. irrespective of what they read about in a newspaper yeah. here on the radio. Yeah. I reckon that's brilliant. We're back here. Where I'm with Roxy Jacenko. I'm going to talk to you about. I'm not going to fuck around. I'm going to get straight into this. I am Roxy. Um, sounds a bit egotistical. It does. Doesn't I yeah. sound like a real wanker? Who came up with the name? Whipper. Whipper did. So tell. Okay, tell me the story. Where this idea come from? What's the deal? My husband went to jail. I got cancer two weeks later, and Michael Whipfly or Whipfly from Nova Nine Six Nine called me, and he's like, "Rox, I think there's a TV show in this." I'm like, "Buddy." I've got cancer, my husband's in jail, I have two children and four businesses to run. There the is no TV was, show. And the media's all over you. <laughs> yeah, I literally can't scratch I, I my can't, nose. I can't walk out of the house without no. getting a photograph. And, and I do not need a TV show. I said, but you know what, call me in a few months and we'll have a d- another discussion. So the guy literally rang me every week. He's like, Roxy, there's a TV show in this. And after about three months, I was like, you know what, okay, let's try it. Has he done this stuff before, Weber? No, he hasn't. Um, he formed a company called Two Scoops Media, and I think he must have a vision of, you know, after radio, he wants to make sure that he's got, you know, another um, venture. So, it, look, it's quite smart, um, and it's done incredibly well. We were 530000 nationally, so that topped, that's the best yet for 10's pilot week. I'm going to tell you, it's pretty good for Channel 10. <laughs> It's a, a bit better than what Rove did. What did Rove do? Poor Rove, oh, bless no, him. It's terrible. Bless Poor him. Poor bastard. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> I, mean, I know what it's like to do, do, do something that doesn't work out. It can be pretty shit feeling. So let's just go back a bit though. So uh, you and uh, Whipper conceived the idea. He conceived the well, idea. Oh, he conceived the idea. You, 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 I was like, okay, in the end. I was like, you know what, again, I've learned this from the beginning. You say yes, and you pick up the pieces later. He was a donor. You yes. had to carry the baby. Yeah, so, exactly. So, and you had to, and he had to, he had to give childbirth too. So, yeah. so, um, how long? What? Because people want to know. How, oh shit! How do I get a TV shop? How the fuck does Roxy just think I get a TV shop? How did you get the TV shop? How did you sell it in the ten? How did that? So work? I actually had nothing to do with it. So Whippa did that. Um, he enlisted Matchbox. So Matchbox actually was the person, it was the company that put the show together. They did was, the filming, they, they did, did the, the production, filming, directing. Exactly. Um, Where did you do it on a studio? No. So it was everywhere. Yeah. Like we we covered the Location. office, we covered home, we covered, you know, it, literally every waking moment of my life we covered from February of this year um, right up until probably June. So we were filming two to three times a week. There was a lot, obviously you saw one episode last week, but... I would say to you in the bag, there's probably another four episodes easily. Um, it was interesting. 
you know, as you know from our di- days at Celebrity Apprentice, it's exhausting. It's yeah. not easy. Um, you experience the highest highs and the lowest lows and then you don't sleep at night because you're like, oh, my God, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Because when I did I Am Roxy, it's not scripted reality. It's factual. It's fly on the wall. Is it edited? I'm no, I have to tell you. And that was one of the things I wanted, you know, and this is something that we both experienced at Celebrity Apprentice, um, you know, back five years ago, I think it was now, that, you know, there were a lot of sequences that were put together and I'm like, I'm sure I never said it <laughs> like that. There was none of that. What you see is was actually happening. Um, I don't know whether I should admit to that because it'll make me come across as a raving lunatic. <laughs> um, well, you t- tell everybody, because not, not a lot of people have, have seen it, not, not everyone listening to this will see it. Well, they the can on 10 play. So it's on 10, yeah, okay, it's on 10 and it's on 10, replayed on 10 yeah. play. But tell us the underlying theme of the show. What's I Am Roxy about? What are, the, what are you trying to pr- promote or do? You know the most important thing for me about it, and I said this from day one, is I want to show people that no matter who you are, what you are, what you've been given, what your education is, as long as you've got guts and gumption, you're willing to take a risk, anything is possible for anyone. And I'm the poster girl for that. Yes, I had a nice upbringing, but that wasn't bells and whistle and everything given to me. What I've achieved, I've had to go out and work my guts out for. And I didn't have formal education. I went to school. I failed that miserably. But what I had was guts, gumption, determination, and a mental state that was failure is not an option. And it shows that you can have anything you want as long as you push and you don't give up. Yeah, but and that's what the show's about. Well, just take me through a, a, an episode. Like, what, what do people expect to see? Um, okay, so what did you see in the first episode? Did you see the renovation of our house where I nearly murdered my husband? Um, divorce is definitely on the cards, but I think that'll be far too expensive. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> exactly. It's easier to stay married. It's far cheaper. Um, so there's a renovation of the house. There's ups and downs of marriage. I mean, you know, there's so many people out there on social media who are painting this perfect life. Well, it's not. It's fucking hard especially when you work with a husband. It shows my business and taking an intern through to a junior publicist and what it actually takes. It's not just being everyone's best friend, but it's actually guiding them to be the best they can be in their role. Um, then you have the children as well. Um, there's a bit of controversy around the fact that I gave Pixie a skim mocha for breakfast. Why? She was tired, Mark. No, but, no, but why, why is there Because I, shouldn't, I should not have given oh, a well, child. bullshit. Exactly. I mean, in Greece and Italy, I'm sure children drink coffee. Mate, my, my, I know my, my, my dad's Greek and like, he was drinking wine. His mother would give him warm wine in the, in the middle of winter in the morning Could, for breakfast. Exactly. So, so, which is all bullshit. Yeah, so you see everything from, you know what, the trials and tribulation of marriage, trying to renovate a house, which I will never, ever, ever do again. I know. <laughs> Until, oh. you do, until you do the next one, but no go way, on. no way, I can't afford it. I hear people say it all the time. Seriously, um, through to business, you know how challenging business is. Business is not easy, and unless you're in it and you're working it, it will not work without you. And there's so many people, like my father-in-law, Nick says to me all the time, "You need to learn to delegate." Well, you know what? If I'm not in there, yes, you can delegate, but you need to be in there managing the delegation. Because if you're yeah, not, yeah. it falls to bits. Totally. And so Sorry. Might, and a lot of times you might as well do it yourself. By the well, time you manage the delegation, you think, oh, fuck I this. I could have I'll already do, done it. I'm paying you money, you money, you money. I'm trying to manage you. I might as well get rid of you. Get rid of that layer. I'll but save then you become money. the world's worst person. You see, and that's what people don't realise. Nothing is personal in business. You are there to deliver. You're there to give results. You're there to make your person who walks in as an intern walk out as a senior publicist in my business. If I don't do all those things, I'm not delivering on what I feel I need to in my business. But what that also brands you as the Gordon Ramsay of the PR world. Well, I'm gonna, I, 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 I'm gonna need to, I need to sort of ask this important question here. And, you know, like, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like, um, I often have to ask myself this question. Yes. Are you a sociopath? Or close to it, do you think? Uh, look. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be judgmental. Do, I'm do you know you. the interesting thing is this, and I had this question. I, it's really weird you mention it. I'm getting hot. I have to take my jacket off. Um, it's interesting you mention it because I had a conversation with one of the girls in my team, Becky, yesterday in my office because there's been stories that have come out saying, you know, Roxy's this, she's that, she's a nightmare to work with because I said something wasn't right on I Am Roxy to one of our juniors. And I said to Becky yesterday in the dispatch room of our office, I said to her, am I that fucking horrible? Is it that wrong? Is this the world's worst environment that you've ever worked in? Is it wrong that I want you to be the best you can be, that I want to teach you from what I've learned? And she's like, no, Roxy, 
really, it's quite normal in here and I want to work here because I know that you will bring out in me the best I can be. But I honestly had then the same conversation with my whole office this morning. I said, guys, am I a lunatic? Am I really that horrible? Because you start for a minute to believe, oh, fuck, maybe I am a bit. Maybe I am horrid. Maybe I'm a lunatic in the office, but I'm not. I think people... When you want to succeed, people in Australia, and I can't talk from an abroad perspective because I've never lived abroad, don't like it. So all of a sudden their instant response is, oh, well, she's a fucking bitch or she's not nice or she's a nightmare to work with. What, because I want you to be the best you can be? So, I, I look, I don't even know the answer to the question. Am I... I don't know. Am I not? I don't but do you, know. You, but did you not care about it? Like, I mean, because I mean, you, you, it because starts to it does start to niggle away at you. Does it? It does start, right. and it's only in the last week that I've thought. You know what? I try and give the best environment, the best experiences, my knowledge, my support, my backing, just for you to do your job. Now, really, should I have to do that? Not really. Well, you're taking personal risk. Yeah, I'm paying you. I'm bringing the client in. I'm the only one who's responsible for it if it fucks up. Yeah, if something goes wrong, you're the one who goes down. Yeah, not them. Correct. So, but and 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 so it's hard. But, and do, you know, but all, equally, though, Roxy, do you really give a shit? I mean, like, oh, how long you do? But how long do you care about it for? When when here it is minutes. You know, f- f- correct. Fitzy's coming to see you, and uh, you're you're under the pump. Everything in the world. I remember, I remember when it happened. I sent you a message. I remember the yes. time everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. You know. Your husband's in jail. Everything was just just a fucking I subscribe shit, total to a, shit um, sandwich. Okay, an MDMA and alcohol diet. Total, <laughs> well, that would have worked. A t- total shit I was sandwich. Slim, but I tell you something, and I don't. I think this is the difference between a lot of you and a lot of people is that it'll hurt for a moment or, t- or so, but the ability to say fuck it, who cares? And what you've gone and you've actually turned that whole experience into a television show. A TV show, two more books. Yeah. So, so how? how two does more that, uh, Why didn't that kill you? As opposed to um, you turn it into something to your advantage. What is it about you that I want you to explain to our audience? That's a mindset that you use. This is about mindset. There's a mindset that Roxy Jasenko can can bring out of herself that allows herself to divorce herself from feeling all this shit and letting it overcome her. How do you do that? What is it? What's that technique? Do you, can you explain it? Have the, you ever thought about it? The technique is on, it, yes. It's a fuck you. You know, you want me to fail so badly that in me I cannot do it. I cannot make all of those people who are my detractors happy because I've failed. They want me to fail. People, that's human nature, sadly. I won't let it happen. So so the difference is what you're saying is there's a question and an answer. The first one is I'm fucked or it's fuck you. Yes. You make the choice. You take fuck you. I take fuck you every time. Not, Not I'm fucked. No. So if you're listening to this, you're, talk, you're listening to this and you want to be successful like this woman sitting here in front of me and you think you got a shit sandwich, well, she's had plenty dealt up to her, that's the call. And the other thing I also say, you know, how fucked really are you? You've got your health. You've got, I have uh, two beautiful children. Yeah, he's in jail. Yeah, I've got cancer. But, but it's also out. Exactly. It's all solvable. So how fucked are you really? Don't give those people the opportunity to think, you know what, she's going to fail. No, no, no. Show them. You but won't. Be, and, and do you get angry with these people? No, who, I don't. I actually what? laugh. Yeah, how do, I how actually do you actually laugh? How do you, you do learn it? it. You know, I'm 39 now. If you ask the 24-year-old Roxy when I started, how do you do it? I would have been like a broken person. You know, the, how many articles have been written about me that are nasty from Andrew Hornery? You know what, now I think every time I read another one, Thanks, buddy. I clearly get you click through, and that's why you keep writing this rubbish. Yeah, this. You clicks. also got me five book deals because you keep putting my name on your page. So keep fucking writing it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship with that sort of writer because you're feeding him stuff and he's feeding you stuff. So in actual fact, both of you are winning at the end of the day. He's getting the click through. Yeah. Write what you want about me. I'm yeah. the Paris Hilton of Sydney. No problem. I'm happy to yeah. own it. Yeah, yeah, t- t- 100% right. <laughs> what else? So I mean, like, so your new TV show. Um, I am Roxy. Um, Just in case I forget my name. Yeah, I am Roxy. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, you've, you've done one episode. How many episodes are there? There isn't any. So, it's part so of it's- 10's pilot week. So, basically, we did the one episode which aired last Wednesday. We won the ratings at 530,000 nationally, best yep. in history for 10's pilot week. Now, it comes down to viewers' feedback. It comes down to numbers on 10 Play, where you can watch it now if you missed it last Wednesday. And then Bev McGarvey and her team of senior producers decide. 
and it'll either and what be announced. They decided, tell me what they decided. They decided if whether it goes a, to series. Okay, so and if there's a series, they they pay for all the cost of it, or did you have to pay for the no. pilot? No, they pay for the pilot. Yeah. Okay, so. Did, someone's obviously pitched it up. Did you have to go and pitch this up at Channel 10 at some stage? Absolutely not. And I'm the world's worst pitcher. Again, oh, is that right? it's, I don't do it. I can't do it. I find it hard. It's not my natural habitat. I can't, I am not good at that. So actually, Whipper and Matchbox pitched it into several different networks. Everyone said no, but 10. And yeah. I think now 10's laughing, and seven and nine must be thinking, fuck. And what was the experience <laughs> with 10? How would you feel? Amazing. Yeah. You know, look, we've had experiences with seven, we've had experiences with nine, ten, and I'm very lucky. I've always got on really well with all of the different networks. I have to say that I really, um, I, I'm very fond of Bev, who's head of um, the content at Channel 10. She's a wonderful woman. She's young. You know, she's been at 10 for many years and she's come up through the rankings, so she's there's a mutual respect there. We've both worked from the ground up. Publicity to paint team were also amazing. I mean, I worked with a girl by the name of Heidi and she got me. She answered an email well, within Heidi, seconds. Um, uh, Heidi Packer. She was at nine before. You'd remember her. Uh, Heidi Virtue. No, different Heidi. Right, okay. Um, but she was amazing. She got me. She was now. She realised that what the business we're in, and really any business that's fruit and vegetable, if you don't sell it today, tomorrow it's off. So we need to move, 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 move. And she got it. So it was an amazing experience. I Look, you know what? And even if it doesn't get up to series for 2009, uh, 2020, and I, and I always say I don't do anything to fail. It was still an amazing opportunity. Because they're probably taking a pitch into advertisers too, by the way. Yeah, I believe so. Because they've got to see where they can sort of fund Make it. Make money. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, well, you've got to cover the cost yes. at least. And so yeah, that, that's quite a clever way of doing things. This yeah, is- it was. And look, it got a lot of press. I mean, there wasn't a radio station. There wasn't anything that we didn't do. And, you know, for me, I've also forged relationships with people like The Project, which I didn't have a face-to-face relationship before because they're in Melbourne. So, so it was amazing. So you probably had the ability then to go and promote it into, um, all, you know, all the radio stations and everything we like did that. Yeah. Every radio station. We did Sydney and Melbourne in yeah. one day. And you know what? At the end of it, I was like, oh, my God, please don't make me say my name again. I'm sick of talking about myself. Like, this is boring now. But people loved it. And, you know, my Instagram following went from 234,000 to 244,000 overnight. Yeah, I know. That, because television is so... Uh, everybody thought that but it's so powerful still. TV is so the most powerful, pa- it's the most powerful well, it's medium. it's because of you that I'm even where I am today. Ah. Celebrity Apprentice. Sorry. Yeah. That put this blonde-haired, big tit girl on the map. All of a sudden, I was just a publicist before that. Yeah, I was doing well. I was making serious money, but it took me from being just a publicist. She's that girl from Celebrity Apprentice. And still to this day, people say, oh my God, you were my favourite on Celebrity Apprentice. And I just remember hoping that you'd fire me because I was like, I'm fucking sick of this, Stephanie Rice. Get me out of here. And Steph has done well too, by the way. She's, she's done well now. She, I don't know what she's doing, but I, know, I hear all sorts of stories about what she's doing. No like, comment on that. No, no. <gasps> Yeah. So okay, right. So Roxy, I got. We got to have to wind up because I'm, we don't give me much time to do this. But we covered off your boot camp. We've covered off your TV show. We've covered off obviously, um, Sweaty Betty. What other things are you doing? What are, is there anything else you're working on? What are we doing? So I've got You've a content. Done the books. Yeah, I've done the books. I've got a content creation agency now because content is king. So it's called Social Union. Basically, we create content for people like Harold's, the retailer, um, Bulgari. So they give us their product, and we create the content for social media. You, you, you mean you're, you're talking about the narrative? Photograph. Photograph. Oh, the photographs? Yeah, so everything you see on Instagram in terms of those grid squares yep. and the stories, yep. we create the visual content. So like magazine editorials. So you've got a team that goes down and does the filming for them? We do it at or- our offices. We've got a studio now. Yep, okay. Um, so we've got that. We've got 18 Communications, which is a Chinese PR company because I think one of the biggest mistakes that people are making in business is they're forgetting about how much um, importance the Chinese have in our community in terms of spending. The Chinese, if you go to the city here in Sydney or wherever you are, who are the people carrying shopping bags? It's mm. the Chinese community. And people are thinking that the Chinese community are communicating on Instagram and Facebook, but they're not. They're communicating on WeChat, Weibo and Redbook. So what 18 Communications does is it manages all of those platforms for different companies like Perfection Fresh, Glue Store. So we have four incredible Chinese girls working for us who do everything in Cantonese and they populate their channels for them. And then there's Ministry of Talent. Um, which is You've my... Had for a while, though. I've had it for years. Yeah. And then I've got a hair accessory business now, which is going nuts. A hair accessory? Well, I was going to wear a headband today, but I thought we'd have headphones on, but we don't, so I could have worn one. But, yeah, that's doing really, really well. So Pixie, my daughter, had that hair accessory brand, which is in Maya yeah. stores, 18 stores. How old is she now? She's eight. Wow. And I'm getting old. No, you're not, you're not. I'll need a Zimmer frame next time you invite me in. It, 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 it's, it's, um, it's interesting you talk about the uh, Chinese market because uh, we had our annual awards night uh, um, two nights ago up in Darwin, and 
every person who won an award, I, not every person, probably 90% of the people who won awards and we put out, gave out 20 awards, were Asians. Well, that's the thing. And this so is they're what the best people, sales people, of the course, best. Of um, course, they're dedicated. Every, they're every, good workers, they're dedicated. And I think people forget, you know, just because we're Westerners, that doesn't mean that we disregard every other ethnicity and how they communicate. So that's what that agency does. Can I, can I, and I, I think a lot of people know, because I, I can't remember, but Jasenko is what origin? Yugoslav. Yugoslav. Yeah. But which part of Yugoslavia? Belgrade. Belgrade. So uh, that's in Serbian. Uh, Serbia. Yeah. So your dad's Yugoslavian. Yeah. And my mother's English. English. She's from London. Yes. Okay. So. She, did you say she's niece Ender? Uh, she, yeah, she's from Hackney. Hackney it's okay. trendy now, but wow. when she lived she, there, it was she, not she trendy. Old those days. Yeah. But like, so you got a Hackney mother, like yeah. a niece and mother, and you got a a, a, a North Ride a, dad, a, a Serbian dad. And, yeah, and that's what gives you well, mate, the hunger. That's called DNA, mate. Yeah. that's where you are at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the Serbians are like pretty fucking tough people, Feisty. and those East Enders are pretty tough yeah. too. So. Yeah, yeah, we're oh right God. if we get into a punch up. Well, Don't what, worry. What, what, watching your mum and dad grow up, that would have been a real experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually wish we could get them in here. I'd love to get them in here with <gasps> yeah. you and do well, an interview. Well, let me tell you, with you. the way their divorce and property settlement is going, there that's may I mean. be blood it'd, on the table. It'd be, it'd, it'd be great. It'd be, gr- <laughs> it'd be great stuff for us. Roxy just saying, go. Uh, yeah, actually, you're a breath of fresh air for me. Um, I've always enjoyed talking to you. I, Thank I think you. you're a, a real talent. Thank you. And Australia loves you. Thank you. Thanks, Roxy.